Okay, 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 okay. Is it working? Ding. Yes, all right, it is, okay. Not sure, <laughs> okay. Okay, everyone, so shall we carry on? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> There's no end to the Dhamma hunger. Dhamma hunger very profound. That's good. Huh? So uh, let us carry on with the, um, this particular sutta. So the, um, uh, again, we are looking at the Arya Pariesana Sutta. We have seen how the Buddha uh, makes this distinction between, on the one hand, the ignoble path, uh, the path where you are searching for things that uh, have the same problem that you already have, uh, uh, in other words, the problems of suffering of life, uh, and then the noble path where you try to find a solution to those problems. Uh, and then the Buddha says the following, yeah. so here again talking to the monastics, yeah, after laying out these two kinds of path, uh, he says this, he says, mendicants, uh, before my awakening, yeah, when I was still an unawakened but intent on awakening, yeah, I too, being liable to be reborn, sought what, also, what is also liable to be reborn. Yeah. Myself liable to grow old, fall sick, die, sorrow, and become corrupted, I sought what is also liable to these things. Yeah, so here we have the Buddha talking about his time before his awakening, before my awakening. And uh, you have this phrase here, which is actually a very interesting little phrase, uh, where he says, when I was still, an unawa when I was still unawakened, uh, but intent on awakening. Uh. So, we are talking about the time before uh, the Buddha reached his bodhi, his awakening state. Uh, and you will see the word there, this idea of intent on awakening. Uh. And you may be surprised to know that this is a translation of this word over here. Yeah, bodhisattva. The, uh, the va at the ending there is just, it's actually two words combined. It's actually bodhisattva eva. So that va, you can just leave it out. It's just bodhisattva, really, which is the word there that is, uh, that, is that word. Uh. And uh, so you may wonder why, maybe we should just leave that word as it is. Why should we even translate that particular word, bodhisattva? Yeah, this is often known in the Sanskrit as bodhisattva. Yeah, and the, the word bodhisattva uh, is often uh, is a combination of the word bodhi, which means awakening on the one hand, and sattva, which means a being. So it means something like awakening being. And awakening being is a strange word. Awakening being is kind of, it's kind of weird, right? And so the question then arises, is that the correct translation of this word? Is that actually what it means? And this is a very interesting point. And of course, later on in Buddhism, we have this whole mythology that arises about the Buddha and how he practiced in four, for four incalculable eons as a bodhisattva. And uh, then eventually, first of all, he made a vow under the uh, Buddha Dipankara. He was the ascetic Sumedha. He made a vow that he was going to become a Buddha in the future. And then he practices for four incalculable eons, and eventually he becomes the Buddha during this particular eon. Uh, uh, but that is a mythology. Uh, yeah? There's nothing about that in the suttas. Uh, the Buddha doesn't talk about the Bodhisattva path in this way. Uh, and this arises in the commentaries in the later literature of Buddhism. Uh, and uh, there is no evidence for that in the suttas. Uh, in the suttas, the way that the word Bodhisattva is used, it is used as you find it here, it is used of the last life of the Buddha when the Buddha is practicing uh, for awakening. Yeah? It is used basically for that time period after he goes forth, uh, until he becomes awakened uh, under, the, under the Bodhi tree. Uh, that is the time when he is a Bodhisattva. And uh, all of this other stuff is really mythology. So in the suttas it has its own particular meaning. Uh, and so what exactly is that meaning? Uh, now the word Satta, Bodhi, we know what Bodhi means, uh, but the second part of that word Satta can, as I said, have two meanings. It can either mean Sattva, which is being, or it can mean the equivalent of the Sanskrit word Sakta. And Sakta means someone who is intent upon something, someone who is pursuing something, something someone who has a purpose in life, right? And so the, uh, probably the correct translation of this world, word is someone who is intent on awakening. 
And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah? After the Buddha passes, sorry, after the Buddha decides to go forth, he is definitely intent on awakening here. He has just seen that, you know, the problems of old age, death, and all these kind of things, uh, decides to go forth to find a solution. And that very idea of finding a solution to the problems of life, uh, well, that is being intent on awakening here. Uh. That kind of fits the context really, really well. And I think that is the appropriate translation of this word uh, right here, rather having this kind of mythological idea which arose much later on, uh, and then read that back into the texts, uh, and as if that actually was the original meaning of this, this word. Uh. So um, and that changes the way we understand the thing. Instead of then not translating the word, just re leaving the word bodhisattva there, uh, actually, once again, if we translate it in, the, in this particular way, it is much more meaningful. Uh, and then we can start to approach what, uh, what really is going on here. Uh. So this is the, uh, the first thing to be aware of. And uh, once we are aware of that, we start to look at the history of Buddhism in a very different way. Uh, we start to understand that a lot of the ideas that are found in contemporary Buddhism are really just later ideas that arose a long time after the Buddha. And uh, the idea of the Bodhisattva is not really at all found in the early suttas, the early Buddhist texts, if you write, uh, like. So, um, yeah, so when he was still intent to on awakening, he says, I too, being liable to be reborn, sought what is also liable to be reborn. Myself being liable to grow old, fall sick, die, sorrow, become corrupted, I also sought what is liable to these things. And this is very interesting, because this is what I was saying before, is that very often we uh, put the Buddha on the wrong kind of pedestal, we think of the Buddha as somehow different from us. But what you recognize when you see this, these are exactly the same qualities as we find in ordinary human beings. Yeah? We are all liable to these problems in our life. Yeah? The Buddha even says here that he's liable to sorrow. Well, this is actually the Buddha to be here. He's liable to sorrow. Of course he is. If he is uh, having a wife and he's having children and all of these kind of things, when they die, of course, it's going to be difficult because you are attaching to these things. You're holding on to them. So even the Buddha to be, even the person with the kind of the most wisdom in the history of humanity, even that person is liable to sorrow when it comes to these issues that are common to all humanity. He's liable to corruption, right? As the Buddha, what the Buddha is saying about himself. Because he is not enlightened, because these defilements are still there in the mind, they are liable to grow given the right conditions. And elsewhere in the sutta, as the Buddha says, yeah, this is from the uh, Dveda Vitaka uh, uh, Sutta, Majjhima Nika number 19, the two kinds of thoughts. And he says in there that me too, before my awakening, when I was intent on awakening, just like here, I too was having problems with things like uh, ill will, yeah, with desire, uh, with delusion. Uh, the Buddha was the Buddha to be was in exactly the same problem as we are now, liable to corruption, liable for these defilements uh, to increase and become worse uh, as a consequence of whatever conditions that he was living in. Uh. So all of these things they show us the humanity of the Buddha. They show us that there is no essential difference. Uh, not the Buddha, the Buddha to be. It's important I get that distinction right. Uh, that there's no essential distinction between every one of us here and the Buddha to be before his awakening. Uh, except that he had many conditions that made awakening possible, of course. Uh, but the humanity is also there. Uh, yeah? There's no essential core difference between the two. Uh. And again, what that means, it means that when we read these suttas by the Buddha, when we understand how the Buddha's path to awakening happened, uh, then we can also know that we too should be following that path, uh, because we are the same as the Buddha was. Uh. This is kind of what this is about. Uh. Yeah, so the Buddha says, I too was seeking all of these things. Uh, seeking things that are, you know, growing old, things that fall sick. In other words, he too was, you know, he had a child, he had a son, the Buddha. Uh, did he have a wife? Maybe he had a wife, it's a bit unclear. Uh, uh, he was wealthy, he had all these belongings, he had three houses that he was living in through the wet season, the cold season, and the hot season. Uh, he had the best cloth uh, 
He had the khaki cloth. His turban was made of khaki cloth. His jacket and his uh, his sarong and everything was made of khaki cloth. Uh, he had khaki chandana. Chandana is the uh, uh, is the uh, uh, sandalwood, uh, yeah, of that time. Uh, so obviously he had some attachment to those things. Uh, and these are the things that he started to understand. They have a problem when he contemplated old age, sickness, and death, and also these other factors here. Yeah. So again, bringing out the humanity of the Buddha. You see this in many places in the suttas uh, that the Buddha is essentially the Buddha to be is essentially like us. So. Then it occurred to me, uh, why do I, being liable to be reborn, grow old, fall sick, sorrow, die, and become corrupted, seek things that have the same nature? Uh, yeah, so this is kind of what makes the Buddha special. It is not the fact that he is not human that makes him special. It is the fact that he has the ability to look into things in a very profound way. Uh, this is what makes the Buddha special. Uh. He obviously has very powerful spiritual qualities uh, that enables him to understand the nature of the human existence. Uh, what am I doing this for? I'm just creating suffering. Uh, there's enough suffering in the world already, and now I'm creating more by attaching to all of these things uh, that are inherently flawed. Uh, and then he thinks, uh, why don't I seek the freedom from birth, uh, the freedom from old age, uh, the freedom from sickness, the freedom from dying, the freedom from sorrow, the freedom from corruption, the supreme sanctuary extinguishment. And again, this is the idea of what makes the Buddha so special, is that he actually even dares to think that thought. Yeah? I don't know about you, but imagine that you live in the world where there is no Buddhism. Imagine we live in a world where there is no enlightened beings, there's no one to show you the way. Would you even think this thought? Yeah, well, maybe I should seek the undying. <laughs> it's kind of extraordinary, right? How can anyone think that thought? It's like really exceptional. And this is what makes the Buddha so extraordinary. And then one day, after thinking all of these things, yeah, he just decides to go off. He goes off into the forest. And this is what comes next here. Some time later, uh, while still black-haired, blessed with youth in the prime of life, uh, though my mother and father wished otherwise, weeping with tearful faces, uh, I shaved off my hair and beard, uh, dressed in ochre robes, and went forth from lay life uh, into homelessness. Yeah, so the Buddha to be uh, all he had to do was this simple reflection on old age, death, and illness. This is the core of these teachings. It shows you how powerful these teachings are. Sometimes we underestimate some of these simple teachings. But this is what made the Buddha go forth, understanding the limitations of life in the light of sickness, old age, and death. Yeah, and from that contemplation on sickness, old age, and death, that is why we have Buddhism today. That is why the Buddha went forth. That is why he was able to make the breakthrough to awakening and to understanding, to enlightenment, through that contemplation. It is very powerful, right? It has incredible potential fruit and results if we make the most out of this contemplation. It led to the Buddha's awakening. So please don't underestimate these simple teachings. It says elsewhere in the suttas, if you really understand the contemplation of dying, uh, you would never disrobe. Uh, how can you possibly disrobe if you are going to die at any moment? Uh, of course, this is what I was talking about before, about being ready to die at any time, because you don't know when it's going to come. Uh, and this is what drives the Buddha forward, uh, and he decides to kind of become a monastic on that basis. Uh, of course, the Buddha had some very, there were some few helpful things, and one of the helpful things with the Buddha was that he grew up and he lived in a society in ancient India that was very geared towards monasticism. Yeah, they had all of these ascetic sects. The idea of being an ascetic or being a recluse and going forth from society was very highly praised in that society. Yeah, there were ascetics already who were practicing really well, who already had samadhi. 
So a lot of the path was already, already available. And if you became an ascetic, you could expect to be supported by that society. Yeah. That is very different from the world today. Yeah. Yeah, most of the world today, it is not that easy to be supported in that way as an ascetic. Yeah. Here in Malaysia, it is not so easy. It is quite difficult because uh, society is not geared toward that. Uh, if you go to Australia, it is certainly not geared towards that. Uh, yeah, it is a very different kind of society. Uh, in uh, the Buddhist countries, it's a little bit more geared to that, but still it is losing some of those early characteristics that were available at the time of the Buddha, where people would just go into the forest. It's becoming more and more difficult, even in the, uh, the Buddhist countries in Asia, becoming more hard because society is becoming more urban, more urbanized, uh, and it's difficult to find forests that are suitable for this kind of practice. Uh, so these were the qualities that were available to the Buddha to be, yeah? And so it made it, that made it a little bit easier, but obviously the profundity of wisdom was already there. Huh? So sometime later, after having this thought, uh, while still black-haired, blessed with youth, uh, if you want to go forth in the prime of life, if you want to go forth and become a monastic, it is best to do it when you are young. Yeah? You know, the Buddha did so in his 20s, he was 29 when he decided to go forth. And that is the best time because that is when you have the energy, that is when your mind is very agile, you have the ability to deal with these things. So we should, it's wonderful when someone young goes forth because it means that they already have an understanding of life that is very mature at an early age. And then we have the idea that though my mother and father wished otherwise, yeah, weeping with tearful faces. And you will notice that this little phrase that you see here, and you find it in a number of places in the suttas, is very different from the ordinary way that we hear about the Buddhas going forth. Normally, the way it is in the developed biography of the Buddha, which is actually a much later thing, there's the idea that the Buddha leaves the palace in the middle of this night while his wife and his child are sleeping. Yeah, He sneaks out of the palace, gets onto the horse, Kantaka, and rides off, right? <laughs> but that's the mythology. This is the reality. This is the early Buddhist texts. This is what actually happened, right? And so what obviously happened was that he had told his family what he was doing. If he hadn't told them, they wouldn't be able to wish otherwise, right? So the whole point here is that he had spoken with his family. And we have to assume that part of that communication would be to make sure that his wife was okay, his child was okay, and that they would be looked after. We need to remember that at that time in ancient India, they lived in large families. And these large families were people where each generation looked after the other generations, they looked after each other. And so it wasn't like now when we have like nuclear families, yeah? kind of just parents and kids living together. In those there's large families living together. So it wasn't as if he just left his wife and child to, you know, to, to nature, <laughs> whatever, whatever may happen to them. Uh, something, he had actually taken care of them. He wasn't irresponsible. Uh, it's kind of fascinating. One of the things that you often hear, you hear kind of the missionaries going to Sri Lanka and going around the world and try to convert Buddhists to Christianity. And one of the things they say, apparently, is that the Buddha is irresponsible. Yeah, he left the wife and child. What kind of person is this Buddha? Much better to be a Christian, uh, yeah? <laughs> and, and, of course, if you are a poor villager in Sri Lanka or even Thailand living somewhere far away, you don't really know enough about Buddhism to be able to answer these questions, right? Uh, but the reality, it isn't, it isn't even true. Uh, maybe it would have been okay, even if it was true, because, okay, enlightenment is like a big deal, right? It's not a small thing. Uh, so maybe it would have been okay still, but it is not even true, uh, the Buddha was responsible. The Buddha did the right thing. He understood how, what it means to look after people. He did have compassion. He did have understanding of people around him. So this is what we should look at. And this shows us that sometimes it is very useful to distinguish between what we call the early Buddhist texts and the later legends and myths that were built up later on. Once we make that distinction between these things, we can start to sort out some of the problems that actually occur because of the later legends that we see in, this, in the uh, uh, later texts. Uh, this is one of those things. Uh, and, of course, the mother and father, they were, had, they were weeping yeah, with tearful faces. Uh, 
You can imagine if you have a son like the Buddha to be, uh, yeah, pretty impressive son probably, uh, and he leaves. No, don't leave. <laughs> Stay, please. You are, you are so gifted. You can become a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is what people always say, right? Oh no, you are, you are very intelligent. Please become a doctor or a lawyer. And uh, of course, uh, he, they uh, they give him the allowance to go forth, right? Because they understand that uh, really they have no choice in the matter. If your son really wants to go forth, or your daughter really wants to go forth, of course you have to allow them. Uh, I think any parent who doesn't allow a son or daughter to go forth. Uh, Unless there are some very good reasons, maybe there are some very good reasons, but if there aren't any very good reasons, uh, I think it is a, a, it's a very bad idea. Uh, we should allow our children to do what they want to do if they really feel strongly for that. Uh, and this is what is happening here. Uh, but they are weeping, just like any parents probably would weep a little bit uh, when the children go forth. Uh, my parents were not happy when I went forth, I can tell you that much. Uh, my father said, we did not bring you up to become a Buddhist man. <laughs> <Monk. laughs> so that was very interesting. Yeah. But, uh, but it, tur it turned out very well later on, so it, it, wasn't, such a, it wasn't such a big deal. Man. Yeah, so uh, this is the, the story here. And then, of course, uh, he shaves off his hair and beard. Uh, yeah. He dresses in the ochre robes, uh, yeah, so kind of yellowish, yellow-brownish robes. Uh, and he goes forth from the home life to home, uh, forth from lay life to homelessness. So um, this is how the Buddha goes forth. Yeah. So we have what we have seen so far. Uh, we have seen the idea of right view. Uh, the Buddha reflects on the world. Uh, he sees the problems of the world. That is right view. To some, it's not the full right view, but it is an aspect of right view. It is enough to make the Buddha go forth. And of course, the going forth, that is right intention, right purpose. Yeah, He changes his idea of what is important. We see the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path being born. Right, This is what happens in the Buddha to be his own life. So, right view, now coming right intention, the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. I'm not going to go much further with right intention. I'm going to keep on going with right view, at least for tomorrow, maybe the day after as well, because I think that is such an important part of this. Uh, but uh, we can see here how these things actually develop. Uh, once I had gone forth, uh, I set out to discover what is skillful, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace. Uh, wh wh where does it stop, this other one? <laughs> Sorry. I went forward. Okay, so that's where it stops. Okay, good. So, okay, excellent, because the timing is perfect. So that's great. So, so forget about the rest. Uh, I forget about what I just said. That uh, doesn't, e doesn't exist. <laughs> so, um, let us take another short break, uh, five minutes. You can do some meditation if you like, or you can have a, a walk around a little bit, uh, and then we continue the Q&A afterwards. So.